Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm here today with Loomis Hardware employee Michael Kester. Hey, I'm proud to, proud to be an employee here at Sam Loomis Hardware. We have two completely, I promise, I swear to fuck, approachable movies. Lost Highway and Psycho. And what are the directors of said movies? David Lynch and Alfred Hitchcock. All right, so, you know, we talked, uh, we talked a couple shows ago. I guess it's been a little while now. The Enter the Dragon show, right? Uh-huh. About um, the white cat petting the white cat. Right. Where, you know, we were afraid, I was afraid, you're never afraid, you have no fear on this fucking show. None. But I was afraid to talk about Under the Dragon because it, it looked hard, it looked scary, I didn't know sure, about it's it. It's artistic looking, it, it, yeah, it's, right. and it's foreign, right? Artistic, foreign, and old. Yep, Those and are very, so I don't know. that's a trifecta of a terror. A whole genre of kung fu I didn't know. But it turned out that there's a villain that pets a white cat. It's really not that hard. This isn't quite the white cat this, this is time. This is the fear that, yeah, that you sure, this sure. is this is when you go in to something scary expecting a white cat to be petted but there is no white cat in sight so this time we do have what appear to be unapproachable movies intimidating films intimidating films that's exactly the word i wanted and uh i wish that there was someone around you know to have told me all right these films i know if you don't know about either of these directors they're huge names. You might not understand them at first glance. Don't worry. I'll walk you through them. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I didn't have anyone to tell me that. Yeah. So I thought, you know what a good thing for our show to do would be to uh, kind of like we did on The Shining way back uh, way back when. God, I guess that's the all the way at the beginning of the yeah, year, right? Yeah, we did The Shining with Bright Full Falls real early. fucking circle over here. I just want to talk about these movies in an incredibly approachable way. Okay. We don't need to hit on all these heavy motifs. We don't need to go... Re- I just want to make Alfred Hitchcock an easy household name that doesn't have all this... Uh... Like he used to be in 1960. Right, right. And then the years passed and he became such a loaded term. You know, I don't think films should be unapproachable at all. So we're going to do what we can to make these intimidating films a little bit more approachable Fantastic. Today. In doing so, we're going to have to spoil both of these films. Use the chapters, avoid the spoilers. There's an additional theme beyond... Uh, <laughs> I guess I wanted to... It's been a long time since we've done a David Lynch movie... And I was uh, trying for a long time to pair something with Lost Highway. And finally, I just decided, you know what? Fuck it. We'll put Alfred Hitchcock in there. That's the only way I could think to make David Lynch more approachable. Mm -hmm. We'll just throw an even more loaded one in there. But both of these movies also have another secret theme. And we can't even mention the theme in either of the movies or anywhere on the show. So we'll just kind of mention that it happens within each movie. And if you happen to watch both movies, then you'll know what the theme is. And you can send us an email. And if you do, you'll get a prize, which is uh, what we'll do a show next week that you can download for free. Everybody's a winner. I think we're going to give them all that prize. So let's start with uh, Lost Highway. Lost Highway starts as uh, almost in Terminator territory once yeah. again. Dangerously I know close to Terminator territory. It is dangerously close, right? Because we mock that all the time. We have our dark highway at night, our David Lynch image that the film was Mm -hmm. uh, sprung up from. But the way this is crafted, you know, it's one of those things. What I love about David Lynch as a director, he can show me a fucking dark highway at night with titles and a song over it. And I already have 10 minutes of shit to talk about. Yeah, well, the, the way the text shows up. The the look of the road, the fact that there is music from a musician from the 70s playing all going on. I'm thinking this film is called Lost Highway. We're going to get some cars. We're going to get some oh, yeah, you're ready road for that. exploitation. We're sure. going to get some anything that I'm already well-versed in and comfortable with. But we depart from the road so fast, and right. we never really return to it. Yeah. There's the one scene with um, Mr. Eddie where there's kind of a moment there. <laughs> some road rage. But it it's never really a road exploitation film, but that doesn't make it disappointing for me. That's good to hear because I know this is also a big experiment for you and I. Yeah. Returning to year one of me showing you films. Mm -hmm. I believe the only thing that ever came out of that was maybe Cube and the fact that you like Blue Velvet. Yes. And so, you know, it was was a long time uh, myself thinking, how do I show Michael another David Lynch (laughs) film and have someone else to talk to about David Lynch stuff? So I don't want to go heavy into interpreting the movie. Because this is, I thought we would slowly make our transition into the crazy, doesn't make any fucking sense movies. Mm -hmm. And they do get a lot worse in this. 
But Lost Highway is already clearly in that yeah. territory. You know, we could have done something like Wild at Heart, uh, maybe even Firewalk with me, but we went straight for Lost Highway. And I think the highway is a little symbolic of someone's descent into madness or perhaps their transition from the first character to the second character. I think that for me, the whole thing going on with this film is that it's not circular. There's no circular sure. return to where the film begins, mm -hmm. except the very last moment where it ends up managing to return. But the entirety of the film seems like it's moving in a straight line yeah. and that you're never going to get back to where you started. Yeah, I agree with you. I totally agree with you. It just becomes a, uh, I guess the big looming question is how do the characters switch? Or rather, how does one character become the other character and then go back? And at some point, you have to surrender yourself to that. So if we're really going to focus on approachability today, I'm going to say, you know what, for now, throw your hands up at that. That's something that you can, uh, you can come back to upon third, fourth, ninth viewing and try and figure out. But there's so much other stuff that I think is a lot more important going mm -hmm. on you know, at this moment. So we're on the highway. You can't see anything but the headlights. The camera's close to the ground. We're already doing this. This is a different kind of highway shot than the Terminator one we, we make fun of. And what I love is the car is going fucking fast. The lines aren't straight. Everything is panicked. We have the David Bowie and the stencil yellow titles. These titles with uh, quite a, a literally unbelievable cast coming at you. You know, you start to see the names and, and they just become more absurd as uh, with each passing title. You have Henry Rollins. Richard Pryor with Gary Busey. And the movie's not trying too hard. It doesn't even mention Twiggy Ramirez. So between the cast and I guess more so the style, it's telling you right away, David Lynch film, we're going to have a heavy signature here. This is going to be something a little different. And later when we start getting into the music too, it's something that makes this movie really distinct. On that Blue Velvet show, when we paired that with the game, we, uh, we mentioned the really incredible music there and that it sounded like it was from the noir era we, uh, we kind of brought up the question, you know, is this original music? And absolutely it is. So the piano player from that movie is in the nightclub. If you remember the scene with Isabella Rossellini, uh -huh. she's singing. Sure. Um, that's actually Angelo Badalamente, who okay. does a lot of the David Lynch music. He also did Nightmare on Elm Street 3, which we saw on this show. Okay. But, um, I mean, City of Lost Children, Cabin Fever, Secretary. Wow. You know, and then Indigo Prophecy. And uh, there was another one we... Oh, Autofocus oh, that we geez. did on the show as well. So he's all over the place. Yeah, in the dark stuff, right? In mm -hmm. the twisted something is not quite right. You know, think about it. Secretary, I mean, come on. Or even Autofocus. That was another yeah. example, too, where the film kind of seems like everything's going to be all right, but the things that aren't right make the film terrifying. Yeah. And so he scored Blue Velvet, and he did uh, Twin Peaks and the Twin Peaks film, Wild at Heart, and Mulholland Drive as well. But there's another name I promised would come up at least one more time this year. Oh, God. And that is Mr. Trent Reznor. Uh-huh. I'll keep it brief and remind everyone that there are, in fact, chapters. Yeah, there's really nothing I want to dwell on here. The soundtrack was kind of put together by mm -hmm. Trent Reznor, and he wrote a couple original things for it. Mm -hmm. The only question I want to bring up, because it's more something I hope someone else has an answer for, is that so he got involved with this? He's trying to get David Lynch to direct one of his music videos, and uh, and somehow that turned into hey, put together the soundtrack for Lost Highway. And so maybe we'll just start this rumor right here because this would be awesome. I believe David Lynch may have helped write the Nine Inch Nails song "The Perfect Drug," mm -hmm. which is a really bizarre song because it never shows up on any official album, but might be one of the most popular Nine Inch Nails songs. Yeah, they never play it live. I don't think Trent Reznor even likes it very much. And it shows up for a, a little tiny bit in the movie. Almost no, not noticeable. Yeah, it's under some car noises. Uh, it's under the, the road During the scene, scene we talked about, yep. that's not, but is road exploitation. So David Lynch does music himself, especially pretty recently. And it's weird. It's electronic and kind of Roy Orbison-y. And when Trent was getting together stuff for the movie, um, some of the stuff that goes on during the tapes and uh, the song Driver Down at the End and The Perfect Drug... Um, him and David Lynch were hanging out together, kind of putting that stuff together. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much of a hand David Lynch had. And if he was just down there for, say, production meetings or if he made the fucking drum loop to the perfect drug. Yeah. I have no idea. Double feature show at gmail.com. That would be fucking awesome. So I have a hard time still determining what my favorite David Lynch film is. But this might be my favorite look of any of the David Lynch stuff. Um, there's some kind of experimental stuff they do here. And then just some really effective stuff that, you know, absolutely works. The, the shallow depth of field and the, uh, the macro shots. Mm -hmm. Techniques we've seen before, but not quite used in the exact same way. 
I mean, it's not only a shallow depth of field where you have, you know, sharp subject, incredibly blurry uh, background, mm-hmm. but sometimes the the main subject isn't even completely in focus. You know, it's such a shallow depth of field. When you're looking at scenes like after they watch the second tape, they go to Bill Pullman's face and it's not really, you know, there's a tiny part of the bridge of his nose mm-hmm. that's in focus and his eyes are a little bit out of focus and you're trying as an audience, I think you're trying to do the camera work yourself. You're trying to focus in on them, and it feels unnatural to you. Or right after that, when Renee's, uh, when she's calling the cops, and it's just showing her lips, and it's not even the whole of the front of her lips that are in focus. Right. Just the very, very front mm-hmm. of that. Which is a shot we see again when she's calling Peter. Yeah, right, right. We go right back down to the lips on that. The camera's put in some odd positions, too. It's very often from above, or uh, in at least one particular instance where they're... Um, in the police medical, you know, prison thing from below. And part of that's the voyeurism element, mm-hmm. which is a little bit of a theme in both of the movies today. Uh, something we saw a lot in Blue Velvet with the stuff, Kyle McLaughlin in the closet, awesome yeah. stuff there. And that comes from the tapes, you know, because the tapes are shot from a, almost a bird's eye perspective. Yeah, well, um, it seems like they're shot from a security camera. Yeah, it does, uh, with the way they move particularly. And they're slow and they kind of pan from place to place. They don't really pan so much as just move in Mm -hmm. a direct line, as if they're on rails. So that's unnerving, because you're getting these fucking tapes, you have no idea where they're coming from. You know, the movie's already scary, and you don't even know what it's about, what it's doing. You just know these tapes should not be happening. Right. And so when the camera's outside, and, you know, after the police visit, it's giving you the bird's eye view again before it comes down to a more natural composition, you know, where you're on the same level as the characters. A lot of the areas, and this is mostly due to the house they're in, they're lit from overhead or, uh, you know, when he's calling from the saxophone nightclub thing, they have all those old school black telephones. They just happen to have 50 of them in their yeah. house, all spotlit from the ceiling. And you see some of the lighting in the apartment. You know, it's got those, there's a prison in Chicago that has those same kind of windows, the straight oh, up and down vertical, yeah. you know what I'm talking yep. about? And so it doesn't allow a lot of light into mm-hmm. the apartment. So they have a one skylight or one fluorescent, you know panel at the top of a wall and that gives the appearance of providing all the light for the scene you see that single source lighting when they're talking to the cops you know the cops have a big light behind them they look all right but when you come back to fred and renee there's just one blaring light coming in from almost like they're being interrogated Uh right it's the police interrogation light and then when you have pete talking to his parents you see the same thing pete comes in he's talking to his mom and dad (laughs) gary Busey plays uh plays his dad and it's just one single abrasive light coming from far off on the it looks like there's a giant refrigerator open just off yep. the set, you That's know, pointing at them. absolutely what it looks like. And so the lighting is something I'm curious about in trying to pin down the mood. Because as we talked about with Blue Velvet, Lynch films are all mood for me. Mm-hmm. Or mostly mood. I shouldn't say they're entirely mood. But that's something that's uh, unique to them that you don't see a lot, even as there's an attempt at replicating it in other movies. It's not, you know, it's not nearly as successful as here. Well, I think that a lot of that probably comes from the fact that David Lynch puts less, he he puts less stock in a cohesive plot, in a strong story. Mm -hmm. And it's more about kind of how the plot and story can affect the rest of what he's doing in the film. I said it while we were watching it, that the plot is what's going on in the film, but it's not what's happening. Sure. You're trying to get inside the character's head. You're seeing how they're, uh, the different characters are affected and how Mm -hmm. you're affected as an audience. Exactly. It's, it's almost, it's almost like an, like a social experiment version of a film. Definitely. As if you're on an alien world, Mm -hmm. you don't understand the language, you don't know the environment, but you can kind of identify with the feelings identify with uh, a sense of urgency or of terror. And that's what these movies are about. Absolutely. There's another piece to that mood, though, which is sort of the timing, the era they're in. Yeah, well, the thing that that I noticed... So I haven't seen a lot of David Lynch. I've seen and owned Blue Velvet. Yeah. And I have now seen Lost Highway, and that's it. All right. Each of these films has this very strong 50s vibe for me. It seems like all the characters are archetypical out of the 50s. Laura Dern, back when we did Blue Velvet, kind of had Absolutely. a poodle skirt girl thing going. Yeah. And we have the the femme fatale in this. Sure. Also, there's a poodle skirt girl that's kind of involved. And there's a big greaser theme. Yeah, right. That's going, everything seems very 50s. Even even the cars, the way the neighborhoods look. Sure, the neat lit. lawns with sure. no... Uh... 
you know, no kind of decoration on right. them. And, and all of that. And I'm wondering whether that's an intentional theme he's using in the film or if that's, he just grew up in that era and that's what he identifies with when he's looking at the ideology of composition for a set or a scene or a character look. Well, we had a bit of an excuse for that in Blue Velvet in Lumberton and in the small town sure. values kind of thing. And I think we wrote it off a little at the time as just, well, that's part of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that whole idea. Here, you remember when we talked about uh, Pulp Fiction? I was mentioning um, the boss's wife thing. Yes. I was talking about how Tarantino was using some noir elements. And a really common uh, thing in noir is the idea of taking out the boss's wife. Mm -hmm. And we see that in Blue Velvet, and we see it here as well. It's just another... It feels more comfortable yeah. in that 40s crime sure. or... 50s household kind of uh kind of area and that's probably because nowadays one it'd be very odd if your employer asked you to take his wife out on a date right and two if your employer were to ask you that it wouldn't seem seedy or shady at all but he does adapt this i mean this is a movie from 97 right so no one's really asking anybody to take wives yeah, out no, on a yeah, date yeah exactly but we're still harking back to that stuff sure. it's still uh conjuring those thoughts up in our minds so maybe those are a lot of points about the mood, but I think another thing we haven't touched on at all is just how incredibly still the beginning is, mm -hmm. both inside and outside this uh, very minimalistic house. You know, the transitions, we have these slow fades to black or the even slower crossfades, the kind of things that are hard to pull out. I mean, a crossfade yeah. in a film looks tacky almost 100% of the time. Yep. Fades to black, especially if you're overusing them, it just seems like you don't know how to seems edit. Seems like commercial breaks. Exactly what it seems like. You know, made for TV movies. And David Lynch is using these in a really effective way to just make everything a little bit more dreamlike, uh, give the notation of a passage of time. But in, in having built this still world, they don't seem out of place at all. In fact, they're more effective. They add to the mood of that. You know, everybody's whispering. It's very quiet. You seem like you're always a little sleepy when these things are happening. And that's the worst time for something urgent to happen is when you're fucking tired. And so it's offsetting when you get this, this speed up in pace after they get the first tape. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it shows the scene where they're fucking and it's in slow motion. You had a couple of really great shots of that. Uh, Patricia Arquette's character is just fucking throughout the entire movie. But, you know, always in slow motion. And then he, uh, and that's juxtaposed right against the scene where he goes into his living room and there's the fireplace. Right. But the fire is going in this extremely yeah. tape sped fast motion. It's so completely unnerving. You're in a sleep like state and all of a sudden the fire is going at a hundred million frames a Burning second. Inferno. Yeah. And it's starting to send these alarms off in your mind. It's throwing off your natural sense of time. It's saying something is urgent. Things are not okay. Why is that happening? At first it's a fire. So you're not used to the way, I mean the speed at which flames flicker. That's uh -huh. not something you think about very commonly. But once you spend a second or two looking yeah. at it, you think, oh, my God, what the fuck is going on over there? It's the same kind of thing with the backward smoke coming from the cabin. At first, it just looks like a lot of smoke swirling around the cabin. But as you look at it a little bit longer, you realize that smoke is eventually being sucked back in. And right about the point where you understand how that, uh, you know, that backwards film gimmick is working, the sound amps up in this wonderful backwards crescendo that cuts off and leaves you stranded there going, what the fuck just yeah. happened? So as we have all the stillness, I mean, it's tension building that doesn't necessarily pay off in a scare. Almost never pays off in a scare. It pays off in some creepy moments, like when Renee turns around and she has the mystery man face. Yeah. But you're waiting for something, you know, something like that, a little bit more of a boo for, you the know, entirety an, of the almost film. 20 minutes before that kind of moment even right. shows up. Especially when you're going down that dark hallway and uh, Fred disappears in the pitch black. And I think Fred's looks and their, you know, their body language doesn't hurt either. I mean, he's looking around like he's constantly suspicious. He's nervous. He's cautious about going into this dark hallway. Right. I mean, you don't know what the fuck's... You don't know if a monster is going to reach out mm -hmm. and eat him. You don't know if he's going to get sucked up. Well, and the last thing you heard, Robert Blake's creepy mystery man was in the apartment. Yeah, right, right. He tells you he's in the apartment... He looks so fucking weird. He's terrifying. Too. He's got no eyebrows. I mean, he's just, he's the guy you don't want in your backseat. He's the guy you don't want down the dark hallway. So we already know that that's the kind of guy who hangs out at parties in yeah. this movie. What the right. fuck is waiting down the dark hallway? In the rare moments that there is a type of horror or scare payoff, it's a medical fucking emergency. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, you get the, um, the gore and the muffled scream and the sound mix from that last tape. 
and they you know they cut through the digital white noise uh-huh. and the kind of uh, uh, gray and blue filter into that blood red. They just you know check into that for a couple seconds and come back out of it. And the scream never gets easier to hear. Right. And that gets cut off right when you're identifying what the sound is. Mm -hmm. It's just abrasion, abrasion, abrasion. It's constantly rubbing against you. Then you have the seizure during the highway transport, you know, when he's in the prison cell and he's getting these headaches. And so he starts flipping the fuck out in this prison cell. There's some sort of blue lightning thing coming in. He's screaming. His face is kind of distorted, but you can't really see it. And then the camera moves into what I just assume is some sort of gore hole. Yeah. I don't even know where (laughs) where it's going or what that is, but it's not a safe place to be. It's Mm -hmm. not an okay place to be. And it's telling you something symbolically about what's happening to the character, but there's so much alarm. That's something David Lynch is good at, is his answers are hidden under... It's kind of that bear or no bear idea we talked about. Bear or no bear was this thing where... It doesn't matter what's going on. There's a fucking leprechaun. We need to get out. (laughs) Right. Emergency. (laughs) Get your priorities in line. Don't ask questions. And so that's kind of the technique he's using is there might be answers in here. There's some sort of symbolism telling you about what's happening, but there's also bloody corpse parts that you're flying through. And one thing just takes precedent over the other at this particular moment. I love that highway scene, too, because as all this fast stuff is happening, the car kind of pulls off to the side Mm -hmm. and you get what might be some of those clues. Um, you mentioned Bright Falls that we did with The Shining. I mean, those, uh, those, the couple moments we had in Bright Falls where it's just showing those fast cuts, fast edits, and then it briefly stops on something fucking awful. Mm-hmm. You know, we're getting like skip, 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 dead twitchy rabbit, skip, fire alarm, right. skip. So the, the moment that you stop, it's just enough to kind of catch your breath and go, wait, what is that? Oh my God, here it comes again. Yeah. I think some of the characters kind of do the same thing too. Um, you have, geez, before I forget, this is uh, Jack Nance's last film. Uh-huh. So unfortunately, you don't know Jack Nance yet, but you'll start to notice him as we do more of these. He's the mechanic in this movie, and he died right after they made the movie. So this was the last thing David Lynch did that he was in. I think it's the last movie he was ever in, but he's in pretty much every David Lynch thing that's well, ever Well, he's existed. in Blue Velvet. He was in Blue Velvet. Yeah, he was one of uh, one of Frank's goons, right? Uh-huh. Right next to- Brad Dourif. Brad Dourif, Yeah. And he was great in Twin Peaks. He was an actual character in Twin Peaks and not just kind of an extra. Oh, but the point I was making was about Mr. Eddie. You know, this character who's nice enough, and then he just completely flips out on the road. Sure. Very similar to the David Lynch character we saw in Blue Velvet. Sure. If we're going to treat that as, The Heineken you know, scene? Yeah, for right. For example? Paps Blue Ribbon. The smallest thing can set him off. It, it's what makes him dangerous. Mr. Eddie is even harder because he seems really nice. He seems like a nice enough guy up front. You know he's dangerous. But Frank didn't really have a good side. Mr. Eddie seems like, as long as you don't, you know, fuck his girlfriend, everything should be okay. Of course, the main character fucks his girlfriend, right, sure. because that's just what has to happen in a movie. Mm-hmm. The sexuality is an important theme, uh, especially worth examining in Lost Highway, where the plot isn't about the characters moving from point A to point B. It's not uh, people accomplishing certain tasks or collecting certain things to reach an end destination. Instead, the plot of the movie really is the themes. The story that it's trying to tell is the same as the themes it's utilizing. Mm -hmm. When you look at the sexuality between these two characters, you know, Fred's sex life is a fucking disaster. Mm -hmm. He's got nothing but problems with Renee. We see that over and over. Pete's sex life, in stark contrast, is, I mean, I think you could say sex life is an adventure. He, uh, everything about it, it's secretive. It's exciting. It's um, it has its own villains and violence too. I mean, the coffee table scene, you know, is one of the most iconic moments I think for many of the David Lynch stuff I've seen. It feels so brutal, and so much of that is owed not only to the orchestration of that specific moment, but to the larger context, yeah. the uh, the time we spend before that, the tone and the pacing. It reminds me a lot of the the gory and kind of bizarre moment we discussed in Blue Velvet as well. Anyways, Pete's sex life. In a lot of ways, it's Fred's ultimate fantasy. If you look at the complete opposite of the problems Fred's having, the type of monotony and lack of excitement, that's the, the polar opposite of what Pete's going through. And so thematically, that's why he's there. That's why this happens. Because that's uh, the story that Lost Highway is telling you with its themes. It doesn't give you an answer in physicality because it's not about that. It's about thematics. 
so there's one technical thing I, I want to try and explain, and you tell me as someone who doesn't use cameras a whole lot in your free time, if you uh-huh. have any idea what I'm talking about. Uh-huh. Can, we, can we try sure. and try and figure that out? Uh, so it's called lens whacking. Mm-hmm. Already it sounds pretty amusing. It's when you create like a whitish film over the front of your camera by masturbating onto it. No, that's called the lens ejaculate is what oh, that is. Sorry. I lens those... whacking is, um, you know, we talked about the shallow depth of field where something is sharp in the front of the frame or the subject of the frame is sharp. Everything else is very blurred. And if you have a, a pretty fast lens, you can get, you know, a very narrow, very shallow depth of field. Some of the depth of fields in, the, in this movie look almost like the tilt shift stuff we talked about mm-hmm. during the social network. Right. I mean, it's extremely, sh- they're, they're fairly up close to the subject. But it's just hard to get that kind of uh, depth of field. So I was looking up some interviews trying to figure out exactly, you know, how the fuck they accomplish this. Is there maybe special lenses they're using or Mm -hmm. what kind of, you know, equipment were they working with? And actually when they found that, so David Lynch is working with his director of photography and uh, he's talking about how they can't defocus enough. They can't pull things out of focus enough for for the visual that he wants. And his uh, director of photography says, kind of joking, that you know we've we've adjusted the lens as far as we can. All we can really do at this point is pull the lens out of the fucking camera. At which point they pull the lens out of the fucking camera. So they get this really extreme defocus by physically detaching the lens, which is something that I guess as long as you're doing it fairly safely, the only uh-huh. risk you run into, you're not going to break your camera or right. anything. You can do this on a, a simple kind of DSLR that you could buy. The only risk you run is getting the dust and stuff mm-hmm. in your sensor. But that's the way they accomplished a lot of these scenes where they have not even the, the shallow depth of field, but just where the camera is doing, it looks like they're post effects, uh, that kind of jiggling. The scene where Pete's on the ground yeah. and his girlfriend's mad at him. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain that's one where they're using this effect where stuff is moving violently in and out of focus or kind of from left to right. It's a really interesting effect and one I've never seen in a movie before. Mm. That's lens whacking. So the one thing that I mentioned way back in the beginning about it being Mm non-cyclical is, I guess, entirely proven wrong by the end of the film. But it's It's just a brief moment. He uh, he pushes the intercom button and you find out that he's the one that says that Dick Laurent is dead. Right. Which kind of starts off uh, before the videotapes and all the stuff in the beginning of the movie. And that's when you hear the sirens, too, which Mm -hmm. you actually picked up on earlier in the movie. In the opening scenes, I heard the sirens pulling away quickly and knowing it was David Lynch, I, I thought to myself, that was no accident, but I don't understand why I know that's Sure, there. sure. It's good when you get that pat on the back, that positive mm-hmm. reinforcement, as if to say, uh, as if to disprove the thing I said so long ago and that David Lynch is making stuff up as he goes. So some of this weird imagery is already coming back around to make a little more sense given a, a new context. And so that's after we're figuring out the tapes, after we get the cameo by Twiggy Ramirez and right. Marilyn Manson. Not one, but two Marilyn Manson songs used beautifully in the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where we get the Driver Down scene. It's, uh, it's the ending, and Driver Down is the name of the Trent Reznor song that was composed for it. And it sounds kind of like the Quake score. It's just this loud, aggravated, repetitive, machine-driven guitar parts. And it's one of the, the favorite eras of Nine Inch Nails stuff, where things were just overwhelmed with noise, where there wasn't even... I mean, there's melody to it, there's a little harmony to it, but it's mostly just insanity and feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's how the end of the movie is. It ends in a fucking climax. He's racing down the road. He has the the sirens going and the machine driven stomping is just continuing. And then all of a sudden, everything starts to explode. Right. As if he's turning into another person or he's making another, uh, another trip. We're getting that association with the highway imagery again. And as everything becomes overwhelming, it just shuts the fuck down. And we go back to Quiet Bowie in the same way we started the movie. <laughs> well, that was really confusing. And, I mean, I love the film. I absolutely love Lost Highway. I'm really glad to hear that. But now we're going to move into a film that I notoriously don't like. But this is also a director that I notoriously am... I would say don't like, but I'm going to default to am not familiar with. Sure. And uh, I will get to the reason that I don't like it. And um, it's it's the end of this film, but it's not the end you might be thinking. That's true. No one remembers what actually happens in the timeline of this film because it does so many weird things. Rarely do our opinions of movies matter on Double Feature. Mm-hmm. But today happens to be a day where, one, I'm super curious about how you feel about new David Lynch films mm-hmm. uh, as I'm showing them to you. And two... I'm kind of there with you on Psycho. 
Now, I love Alfred Hitchcock. Mm-hmm. I love a lot of his stuff. Not so much the weird Cold War torn curtain stuff, mm. but all of the mystery evil, whodunit. Evil Birds movies? Uh, I don't like the Evil Bird one either. I don't like the horror ones, and I don't like the Soviet ones. Okay. But I fucking love the wrongly accused, the voyeurism, uh, the strangers on a train stuff. I love all of that. And he has so many films that are so consistently good. But Psycho is one of the most well-known ones. And I really wanted to start there because I feel like a lot of our audience knows Psycho and doesn't like Hitchcock as a result of Psycho. Mm -hmm. And so I figured if we could talk about a couple things it does, we could at least establish, one, that it's noteworthy, and two, that we identify with the feelings that a lot of people have. Part of what turns, uh, let's say, a modern horror audience off of a movie like Psycho right away is the first time in American cinema stuff. Yeah. Uh, We've complained about it before, the first slasher of all time thing. Yep, that's not true. Which is still not true Mm -hmm. at all. Although there's probably more influence in our slasher directors that we like of Hitchcock than we thought there was. So unfortunately, you know what, not unfortunately, because it really doesn't apply to what ended up becoming of the slasher genre. But we have the the male lead that we are introduced to in the uh, sex scene in the beginning of the film. Yeah. Uh, and his name we see on a sheet later yeah, at his stationary. hardware store is Sam Loomis. Now, right. I know what you're thinking. Sam Loomis sounds like a remarkably familiar name. And that's because we've seen Sam Loomis at least 10 times sure. on our show. <laughs> sure, right. So far in the three years we've done it. Sam Loomis is the name of the doctor in the Halloween series, yep. the, uh, the Ahab, the poster child Ahab yeah, to go sure. back to behind the mask. But Sam Loomis, so clearly John Carpenter, and the more you think about it, the more obvious it becomes, sure. is a big Hitchcock fan, if not at least a big Psycho fan, right. if not at least acknowledges Psycho did some of the things that he ended up doing with Halloween. Yeah, it's a popular moment in, mm-hmm. the, uh, in the history of horror cinema. Sure. And so it influenced a lot of these guys. But I mean, I, I want to dismiss that first time in American cinema thing. Mm. I want to dismiss it almost just as hyperbole. It's something you fall into, and I might even fall into it as we talk about this a little, just in speaking about Hitchcock, because it was, you know, the American mainstream. A lot of the things that Hitchcock did for the first time, he didn't do for the first time, but somebody else in some foreign film from 10 years earlier might have done it. Maybe he didn't even see it. Or maybe it happened in a silent film. Or we could just keep crediting Fritz Lang for everything in Metropolis. Right. Because everyone else does it, so why don't we just fucking (laughs) do it too? So we know that the lesser known stuff came first. But I want to credit him more, and it could just be a happy accident, for popularizing a lot of that. We're looking at him uh, less as a director when we talk about stuff like that, and more as a, a cultural icon. As somebody that existed in an era, was the most popular at something he did, which happens to be a thing that we now love. And so we see that influence. But I mean, Psycho itself is even, let's just look at simple stuff like Jekyll and Hyde, right? A split personality killer. Uh, Someone who seems remarkably kind at one moment and can be remarkably cruel or murderous or treacherous in another. Um, Of course, that was happening even before Jekyll and Hyde, Mm. but there's even another popular moment. There's something like Touch of Evil, which we covered, which Hitchcock even cites as an inspiration for the movie Psycho. But part of the reason I think the guy was so famous is because he's just kind of a funny guy. You've seen him introduce a couple of his movies. I mean, he uh, he's kind of round and he just looks like he's he looks like he's fun. He looks like he's a fun guy to talk to. He doesn't look like the master of horror cinema. A lot of these scary, scraggly looking fuckers who make movies today or maybe even someone like Eli Roth, mm-hmm. who seems like he might be a little scary to be around. Yeah. I'm sure he's a totally fine guy. He wears enough Cannibal Holocaust shirts <laughs> sure. that you can be nervous. And so Hitchcock is almost the opposite. He's jovial, you know, of what yeah. his films are. But he puts himself in his films anyways. Yeah. And so there's a little bit of, a, you know, what you think of as an egotistical director mm-hmm. element to that. I don't know enough about Hitchcock to start lobbying personal insults at him. Sure. But people say that about him uh, yeah. a lot, is that he was a little full of himself. Yeah. He was a perfectionist. He was proud of the work he did, and he put himself on display just as much as you know his films were. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to have to just go on the record as disagreeing with you and saying that I feel like Alfred Hitchcock looks exactly like a pompous master of film. Sure, maybe a master of film, but not a horror guy. Uh, the way he talks, there's nothing scary about Alfred we're talking Hitchcock. About, but we're talking, about, we're talking about horror in the 60s, when horror was more based on suspense, sure, and less okay. based on 
raping the natives. All right, but you do look at Alfred Hitchcock today and giggle, don't you? Oh, I've I mean, always when he shows up at in, in the Hitchcock films and giggled. I mean, he's just funny. It makes the films less scary. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe not less mysterious, but but less scary. And so he did a lot of interesting things throughout his career. And in doing Psycho today, part of my hope was that we could eventually get to the more interesting stuff down the line. Uh, he capitalized on television when film was starting to die out. He talked a lot about the moral responsibility of voyeurism. When you look at something like Rear Window, that's all Rear Window is really about, mm-hmm. uh, or certainly the most heavy motif in that movie. There's something like Strangers on a Train, too. And uh, there's a tiny bit of voyeurism in Psycho, but it's really only the moment before the kill. You can see that his interest is there, but it doesn't really bring up any questions about voyeurism. Right. You know, he's putting a couple of his themes kind of on the back burner to let the horror moments be what's highlighted here. And then he also had a lot of the wrongly accused films, the uh, films that made you question the prison systems. And you see that even here with the police officer. You know, we know the police officer is doing his job. He's pulling over somebody who actually stole. So one, he's just looking out for her. She was sleeping in her car. But two, he's actually on to somebody who's Mm -hmm. a valid suspect in a crime. And we should be rooting for him. But somehow we get behind Janet Lee's character. We get behind Marion. She's being, you know, sassy to the police officer. She's putting him down in a way that we might not even see in a movie today. Yeah. Uh, in a way that's, you know, hyper realistic, maybe flat out unrealistic, because the police officer is a menace. He's part of the system. Uh-huh. This was hippie mentality before hippie mentality existed, before right. it, long before it made its way to cinema. Another big reason to rally behind this guy is uh, the taboos that he was working on shattering, particularly in Psycho. That's one of the things that's highlighted here. This is, uh, so we talked a little on Touch of Evil, I think, or especially in the old noir stuff, about the Hays Code. Yeah. About this this movie production code that basically said you couldn't do bad things in film. You couldn't make films interesting, I believe is what the Hays Code was. was. It was a guideline to make sure that films only highlighted the good parts of the American lifestyle and that everybody ne- that everybody kept their clothes on nobody had sex nobody did drugs nobody killed anybody everybody was a good person and at the end the good people always persevere and that's one of the things that makes looking at crime movies from that era interesting because we're dealing with the very things the Hayes Code hates mm-hmm. and then at the end we always see how the criminals have to pay right. because they always fucking die or go to jail or justice is always served in the Hayes Code movies And it's been in effect since the 30s, and it didn't go away till the late 60s, but it just started to not get enforced as stringently anymore. And I think Hitchcock especially had power because, you know, the Hays Code wasn't a law. It was something the studios decided to do before the MPAA existed. Mm -hmm. But Hitchcock could say, I'm a famous director, I make popular movies, and he could really push them to try and get stuff through in his movie, as he definitely did in Psycho. You see that just the movie opens in a hotel fuck scene. Right. Not only are these characters not in separate beds, but the idea is that they were going to a motel so they could have sex outside of marriage. In an era where it wasn't even okay to use the same bed in film, they're Mm -hmm. having sex outside of marriage. That was something that made the censors just crazy. But this is also apparently, I'm told this is a big deal, the first mainstream film with a toilet. Okay. So I don't know if you noticed this before the 60s. Probably not something you, Michael Custer, were keeping tabs on. No. No toilets. No toilets before the 60s. Couldn't flush one, couldn't hear one, could not look inside one. Huh. How weird is that? That that was actually, that was a taboo of cinema, is the toilet. What was the fucking thinking there? Like, I don't know. Who could possibly be bothered? This is somebody's job, to go through movies and say, ooh, toilet scene, can't have that in there. Someone actually gets paid for this? Yeah. That's, I mean, I, I could totally understand why you wouldn't want a toilet in your movie. I mean, talk about just crippling art, right? Sure. It's, it's not even, there's no valid argument here. You can't possibly say that putting a toilet in movies is going to corrupt American youth or create killers. Well, you know, everyday people don't encounter toilets. Again, it just gets back to that taboo thing. It just gets back to here's something we don't talk about. And therefore, let's form a committee to talk about how you can't talk about it behind closed doors. The most fucking backwards thinking thing of all time. So Hitchcock fought for it and he got his toilet in the movie and he got his shower scene. Mm -hmm. The uh, the famous, of course, the shower scene. And he got his motel scenes and that kind of stuff that makes Marion a different type of character. She's still the bad protagonist. She's still crime drama, but she's not a frail woman. She doesn't represent the morality of the country. She's not the voice of reason. Well, the thing that's that's really strange about Psycho is that 
the voice of reason in the film. And, and I mean, we get this kind of the mother slash Norman always being, you know, against sex against, I mean, the female persuasion in general, yeah, right. Against all of what, I guess the Hayes code would be sure, sure. saying was bad in the film. He ends up being so cut off and so held back from the realities of the world that he loses his mind and ends up killing people. So I'm sure there's some commentary there as blatant or subtle as you want to assume it is. Norman Bates as a character in general is, uh, is one of the most interesting things about the film. Oh yeah, absolutely. He is, um, you know, if you want to talk about influence over time or how psycho might've changed cinema, it was only a matter of time until we got a likable killer, but this was our mainstream likable killer. Mm -hmm. Norman Bates was a guy that you see him, he comes in the movie and he's almost a love interest. Mm -hmm. He's somebody where you're saying, all right, you know, Marion's run away. She's at this hotel. This guy showed up and now they've developed a rapport. Sure. He's bringing her well, dinner and they're going, are we going to go in the motel right, room or in the right. office? And he's an innocent guy. He's a good looking dude. He could come in and be kind of the nice boy who convinces her that maybe what she did was wrong. Right. And all she has to do is go back. And if she does it with a smile and keeps her, you know, Right. Repeat, minds her P's and Q's and keeps her nails clean that this call just blow over and the two of them can start a family in two separate beds. But instead he stabs her in the fucking gut. Dressed as a lady. You know what's funny about that is that's 48 minutes into the movie. That's true. 48 minutes into an hour and 48 minute movie. So halfway through, our protagonist dies. Mm -hmm. That's fucking cool. So we the prota protagonist, really. Yeah. So protagonist just goes away. We're thinking we're going to, you know, we're wondering all of these important questions. What's she going to do with her life? Is she going to go back? How will the people, you know, how are her peers going to judge her? Will she go to jail? Is mm -hmm. she going to get in trouble? And just as when you fucking die in real life, your affairs are not taken care of. Our concerns, the things that were our previous concerns, no longer matter now because we got stabbed in the goddamn shower. Kill off your main character because you can never predict death and the stories don't get finished just in time for your character's life to end. Right. It's done in a way that once the character's dead, we just introduce a bunch of brand new people. Yeah, they're trying to solve the crime. Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, a whodunit, we actually saw the crime take place. And these are the people playing Clue now. Mm -hmm. Complete with the Tim Curry character at the end of oh the film. Oh my god. Up. When you hear people talk about how this kill at the time was so brutal, mm -hmm. I didn't see it at the time. I don't know anything about that. Yep, I wasn't it's there. in black and white, so I don't get to see my Herschel Gordon Lewis going on. But what I do know is that there was the trailer for Psycho, which was very adamant about not telling people the end. Do which, not tell your friends. Yeah, that was really, that was the whole Psycho campaign, which I think should just be, that should be an understood thing, maybe. That should be in the block text at the end of every trailer, under when it comes out. I would just be happy with a one sheet, some font, and do not tell your friends. Yep. For every movie. Absolutely. <laughs> There's piranhas, they're in 3D. Hey, do me a favor, don't tell your friends. Mm -hmm. So we later find out that Norman's a pretty cool guy. When we see him out of the interaction with, uh, with Marion... We see him talking to the PI, and he's so relaxed. Mm -hmm. He's so casual. These guys talk like they're old friends. But when he's stabbing her in drag, it's in the shower. It's this ultimate invasion of privacy. It was one thing to show a note being flushed away in the toilet, mm -hmm. but now she's being stabbed in the shower, which is probably the one place in this whole goddamn movie she thought she had a moment just to herself to kind of right. consider what's going on. So Hitchcock's already showing you the voyeuristic moment showing you that he can see her getting in the shower. You're feeling a little defiled there. And then he stabs her there. I mean, there couldn't be any more ultimate crime in the movie than that. Well, you know, there is one more ultimate crime in the movie, but I know there's something else you want to say first. Well, only because you brought it up. There's, uh, you know, don't, don't tell your friends the ending. There was a campaign that Hitchcock had that basically said you could not, you know, there, there's actually posters drawn up for it that were displayed in the theaters. He said, when you show my movie in the theater, you cannot allow people to go in late. No one can come in after the movie starts. And in fact, it kind of goes back to when we talked about Cronenberg uh, and Eastern Promises, mm -hmm. how in his interviews, he was really direct in saying, look, I'll talk to you, but you can't possibly spoil the fucking movie. I don't want any plot stuff at all. We just can't cover it. He was afraid that it would ruin a plot moment in that film. And Hitchcock was kind of the same way. And he even forbid the stars of the film to go on talk shows mm -hmm. at the time to promote the film because he just didn't want anything to come up and plot. You know, he probably thought because that turn comes 48 minutes into the movie, that's the big surprise for the audience. That leaves them scrambling, trying to figure out where the movie's going from there. And if someone were to ruin that, 
it already gives them a heads up. They're not in nearly a state of panic right. as, as they would be. Well, and so we talked about this other major crime, but it also kind of makes sense as to putting people in panic. They play into the same thing. So at the end of the film, there's this awful moment. It's, it's actually longer than a moment. You're talking about Tim Curry, right? Yes, That's, I'm talking yeah. about the moment where a man who would be Hitchcock walks into a room and as smugly as he <laughs> fucking pleases, yep. explains step by step, not only what happens in the film, but the second layer that you didn't understand because you are a dumb audience. Oh, hey there, audience. That was only there and showed up late or told all your friends or whatever was yeah. left scrambling by the 48 minute mark on every other show where we give directors or writers credit for giving the audience some credit. Mm -hmm. This is the opposite of that. Yeah. It's just a guy who smugly comes in, lights a cigarette and just takes his goddamn fucking time telling you why you were too dumb to understand what you just watched for an hour and a half. And I hate that. That's what I don't like about Hitchcock. That's what I don't like about the movie. And that's probably the only thing I don't like about each. Yeah, I keep bringing Tim Curry up because when we saw Clue, that was the gag in Clue. Mm -hmm. And there's really no reason to. First of all, the audience gets it, right? Yep. Having never seen Psycho or knowing anything about Psycho or Hitchcock, seeing Psycho for the first time, I understood what was going on. It's enough to say, well, I don't think the audience is going to guess my twist before it happens, mm -hmm. but to drive it into the ground, probably a little bit unnecessary. Maybe just a tad. Come on, guys. I know it was the 60s and stuff, but Jesus, fuck. Nobody was ever that dumb. See, I told everybody that wasn't so bad. No. Right? That was a lot more approachable than people thought. Yeah. And now that'll allow us to move into, let's say, the better Alfred Hitchcock films uh -huh. and the more fucking weird, I don't understand. I'm... Here's basically what I'm trying to do is build myself back up to Mulholland Drive uh -huh. because the first time I saw Mulholland Drive, it filled me with hate because I didn't get it. And I think I'm well over that now, but I'm just trying to give myself as much of a bonus as I can, uh -huh. as many tools to, to fight Mulholland Drive with before I watch it again. And I'm, I'm hopefully I'm able to just surrender myself to the movie the same way we talked about Lost Highway. Right. Well, and another bonus is that we finally have uh, wrapped up show 150, which means... Holy crap. Nothing. It really doesn't mean... No, completely arbitrary anything. number. Uh, if you've listened to all 150 shows, uh, we have a website that you can go to and listen to all 150 of them one more time. Thank God. That's doublefeatureshow.com. You can send us some suggestions of films to do next year. That's doublefeatureshow at gmail.com slash our garbage bin. And uh, we have uh, iTunes that you can go and leave a review on. Tell and a us. Facebook. That's important, Oh, yeah, important we have too. Facebook. That's the social networking site that people really dig. So beyond that, there's also more films coming up next time. Yeah, we're going to do Girl Interrupted and Reform School Girls. We're basically going to make people go through one more really heady movie, and then we're going to do Reform School Girls. Yeah. We're having other conversations similar to the ones this week. And then we're going to do some punk rock prison reforming something. Keep it in a thong and watch more fucking film. Bye.